Once upon a time, the universe was populated with spirits. There are spirits for everything. People a long time ago believed in different spirits or gods. God of the ocean, God of just fishing alone. The ocean has its own spirit. Trees have their own spirits. There are all kinds of spirits. Inuit. Elif. 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 Sometimes ghosts, sometimes spirit, sometimes God, sometimes malicious ghost uh, is reconstructed for Proto Micronesian, that is the ancestral language of all the Micronesian language, as something like Anitu. The spirits were constantly interacting with people in the past. Islanders depended on them for assistance in many aspects of their lives. In order for have blessings on your sailing, on fishing, anything related to the ocean, you have to pray to that God of ocean. <laughs> We Palans believe that there are bad spirits staying in the tree. So what we do, we get a basket, we put some taro in there, and bitter nut, and then bring that basket to another tree, and leave it under the tree, and then come and sit down and ask the spirit, please go to the other tree and eat those nice food for you. In much of Micronesia, the world inhabited by humans and spirits was imagined as an inverted bowl, with only part of it visible to living people. <laughs> The view of the universe, the, the sky world and the physical world is kind of really seen as, say, like an upside down bowl with people living on the physical surface. These different sections or, or levels of heaven also have names. That's where one layer of sky ends and then you go through that layer of sky you see another horizon, you go through another layer of sky. So they say there are nine layers and you get to uh, follow mine, that's heaven. At the edge of the world, composed of islands and the sea, was a sky that folded upward into Kachau, a region off the map of humans. The word Kachau really is um, has a sense much more of someone being from some something distant and remote and perhaps even relating to, to the sky world as opposed to this world. That area way, way, way down there on that side or that area way, way there on this side. Yeah. This is the world, this is our universe in the end of the horizon, that's the end of our world. For the people of Kishrai, the word for this region was Inkashrau. Inkashrau is basically heaven. It's the entire heaven above the earth. 
I've also heard people talk about what happens if you sail too far. You reach a place which is very mysterious, and there are strange creatures there, and you've moved into a different realm. The top layer of the world was the home of the sky gods. Taukatau is, is a common name, Naisapu, Luke Naisapu. I think it was a, a reference to uh, another supreme being who is, who is in the sky. Underneath, below the bottom of the sea, was another layer, the world under, we might call it. Some of the gods lived there. Uh, the person who dove too far down, he was chasing a turtle. Uh, but the final destination was almost like inland, but inside of a, a community meeting house. And that is a reference to the image, reference to the underworld. As for the level of the universe that humans called home, some people had legends on how the islands were created. Palauans tell this story. There was only Angar, and the, the shrimp gave birth to those uh, four kids, and one was Wab. He grew up by the hour, not by days, but by the hour, and uh, got to a point where he ate anything. After a while, just maybe within one, one month, he's already a giant, and... They couldn't afford to feed him because it was only a small island, and they ran out of resources. The villagers now were so afraid that he was even eating their children. So they were looking for ways to kill him or else he will kill the whole village. So they burnt him and when they burnt him he fell and then formed Paliliu and all the other islands of uh, Palau. In the ancient spirit world of Micronesia, there were several different types of spirits. Heavenly spirits, like Anulap, the father of the gods, for his people in the Central Carolines. Anulap, Lugailan, Folfat. Or Daukachau, for the people of Ponape and Koshrai. And Daukachau is, is a common name between here and Koshrai. Nansapwa, the thunder god, the vehicle through which good things came, the bounty of the land. Margigi on Yap. Margigi is one of the two girls who came from Evan on a thread. Margigi's sons were the basis for the political and social structures on Yap. Palau had its own sky gods. To Elia, that means he, he is the god of heaven. Aragim is a rainbow, and it was a, uh, some people believe uh, in Aragim as the god of uh, warriors. Marshallese too had their heavenly deities. The gods were one for the ocean. The Jinunuman and one for the sky. Laulip. Another type of spirits were deities associated with certain clans, perhaps representing gods that they originally brought with them. The spirit that was called Shal Shal. Growing up, I hear a lot of Shal Shal. He was a spirit that was. Uh, supposedly as strong as Ninamata Fatiti. The clan deities such as Inas of uh, the Songkawat or Lamortalung of the Dipulap. Ninamata Fatiti was uh, oh, 
You can tell hundreds of stories where she was protecting her clan. Then there were also the spirits of nature. The spirits who haunted the flats offshore or certain spots on the island. The bad spirits uh, usually like to stay in the dark uh, place, like a monkey pottery. There's an island, you don't go there because that uh, Ogiwamu, the one that hit people, stays there. Yeah, there is a rock where the chicken lives. This is the home or the place of this chicken. You can hear all kinds of weird noises there, even roosters crowing. Under sea, under the water. In that particular area of the reef. Before you construct a dock or like a landfill in the ocean, you also get you have to get some protection so horror doesn't get net. Places where the nature spirits dwelt were dangerous and best avoided. There are places that people are afraid to go at night because usually there's ghosts there. It's a prohibited place, because that's where the evil spirits are. They come and they grab whatever spirit of humans they can catch, especially the vulnerable ones. They said the pregnants and the little babies. Oh, take the baby inside. You know, there's a spirit that will come and steal the baby. There are some things that we should not do when in that you shouldn't be burning the coconut. Don't eat raw fish in this area. The, the seagulls will uh, harm you if you do that. That place, they say, there's a lot of evil spirit there. And uh, if you're uh, not from that village, and you're traveling, you should pass through there before sunset. That place was supposed to be so haunted. Finally, there were the spirits of the dead, spirits that continued to exercise influence over the living, at least on some islands. Heavenly spirits or gods were few in number and generally distant from the ordinary lives of islanders. But there were some exceptions. One notable exception was Lu Keilang. If you were to literally translate Lu Keilang means halfway between heaven and earth. Lu Keilang was very influential god and giving certain useful knowledge and skills to people on earth, including perhaps canoe voyaging, building canoes. Lugailen is famous for controlling all things. Lukelang was revered as a giver of gifts, canoe making, voyaging, and even a gift of sakao to Pompeii and Koshrai. He was a spirit who guided people in carving or in felling trees. In Yap, however, Lukelang became the god of death, flying about with a net to snare souls each day to meet his quota of lives taken. Luke is a bad spirit and he lives in the West. There's a, a saying in Yap that uh, children are told not to stay under the, where the water comes down off the roof, because that's where Lugelian comes and snatches the souls. 
there were a handful of other heavenly gods who affected lives. Inemes and Chuk. That Inemes is a spirit of love. They can make a magic or a perfume, and uh, they do that in order to have uh, that person who will fall in love with, uh, with that person. That sort of white magic has not at least find its way to perhaps smaller island communities where we go, but uh, it's a Chuki's medicine. Another was Heiwanu, the goddess of breadfruit on Puluat, who appeared in the form of an eel. On Koshrai, however, the goddess of breadfruit was worshipped as Sinlaka. She was many things. She was the breadfruit goddess. She was powerful enough to rule the ocean and the land. And she influenced storms and typhoons. Queen of nature. When people need food, you know, she always gave them this. Uh... None of the other gods' names were, were as remembered as uh, Sinlaka. Daukacha was a heavenly god honored on Pohnpei and Koshrai. A guardian spirit for the produce of the land where they have uh, prosperity, Taukatau was involved. Taukatau is the same deity that the title of the traditional leader of Koshrai uh, came from. That is Taukashra. Taukatau was very similar to Lukelang in many ways. You have the reference to Luke from west to Pompey, but it stops and you have Taukatau from you to Koshrai. They are supreme beings, uh, and they are both uh, either in the middle or above the sky. Probably the most famous of the sky gods was Oliphat, the trickster god. There is a uh, legend of uh, Lugaila. She came down and then got somebody pregnant. There was when Oliphat was uh, born and started walking. Oliphat. Uh, uh, bit off his own umbilical cord and start running away when uh, people start chasing him. Then to him, because he was still a kid, the boy just ran and started wiping himself on the coconut tree trunk, hence the saying that the, the red markings or you know that you see on the coconut tree trunks are actual uh, blood remains of Oliphant. The story of Oliphant has always been a trickster guy, because <laughs> As he was ascending to look for his father in heaven, he ran into a few boys who were playing with the shark, and Olafat uh, uh, managed to get into the group and somehow trick the boy that he doesn't like amongst them by fooling him to hold the shark. Olafat kind of flipped the shark over, belly up, and gave him, said, you know, this shark is dead and you can play all you want with it. Uh, sure enough, when Olafat uh, ran away from him, the shark turned around and bit the boy's arm off. There was a similar trickster god in the marshals called Letao. I only know of Letao, the trickster. <laughs> Once a time, he, he tricked his brother to when they were the one fishing, some men were preaching and then he became a, he asked his brother, why don't you be the K, the provost, the fish? And I will be the turtle and we can go swim near the fishermen. So when they went there, the fishermen tried to spear them because he was, you know, the shell of a turtle. The spears broke, but his brother got hurt because he was only a K. My grandfather, every night, there was no TV back then, but I uh, used to tell us stories after dinner every night. And then he always talk about Ledao. And at the end of the story, he would say, then Ledao moved to the States, to America, and they call him there Jack. So I said, oh, 
Now what is jack of all trades? Because the trickster was supposed to do anything he wanted to do. Even Palau had its stories of trickster gods. The stone pillars in Babeldaup were a testimony to the mischief one of them caused. The story of uh, Badarulau, it's a men's meeting house at Ngarulau in uh, Ngaralong State. And uh, there were a group of gods who were planning to construct uh, thereby on one of uh, the terraced hill in Ngaralong. Uh, the by we, uh, that they planned to build was only stone pillars. And, and then this god from Airai uh, heard about it. And he, he was one of the gods who was supposed to be working with these other gods. He woke up late one morning and, and learned that all their friends have done their part, their share of the construction, except him. Those gods were only working in the evenings because they don't want to be seen by human. So one evening, uh, that Ira God uh, decided to trick his friends. So he, he lit the coconut husk and threw it up on the air. All the other gods who were at the work site uh, thought that it was already daylight. So they, they left the uh, abai unfinished and then disappeared. Olafat in the Central Carolines, Letao in the Marshalls, other guardian spirits in Palau. Nearly every island group seems to have had its own prankster spirit. Tales of these gods are remembered and recounted, even today. Even so, it was the lesser spirits, not the heavenly deities, who exercised the most day-to-day -day influence over the lives of islanders in the past. These lesser spirits might be clan gods, patrons of islands, villages, or families, who are looked to for assistance in times of need. So whenever they uh, would go to war, they would make special prayers and dances to these gods, bring them offerings, and then they will go. They said they will, uh, he helps them in wars. I heard from ancient time that if they need help, like if you're lost in the ocean, you call it, uh, call Ngirablilio, help me. Women to bear children, food to multiply, the fish uh, to be plentiful in the sea, uh, keep away the, the illness, keep away evil. In Palau, villages often took their protector spirit from the highest ranking clan. There's a god for its village, its families. Its island, its place, they have their own god. The god of their place to protect their own people. They built small god house where they go and talk to their gods. It's a small thatch roof uh, house that you can hardly go inside. They bring offering, food, pillow nut. And they have a like built an altar in the corner of the house where it's uh, holy and that's where they put the pill nut, the food for the spirit. They pray and they do the sacrifice. They go fishing and they get the small fish about this size and they put the fish inside the, the wooden container and they put them on fire and when they done they took all the fish to the house of cats, the spirit house. Now. 
offerings are always made uh, to this uh, family or clan gods for protection, for wealth, for good luck. When they prefer themselves to war, they'll have to go to the Bai, just like this one. And the god is standing uh, made from the wood in front of the Abai. Oh. The gods used as their messengers certain animals, so the particular totem animal of a clan or village had to be respected. Each clan in Angar had their like animal spirit, centipedes, sharks, and barracudas. Stingray, and millipedes, centipedes, eels. This is like a devil ray. Butterflies, small crabs. The clans and lineages during that time, they had clans of the heels, clans of the mandarays and uh, turtles. We take a young coconut, we open it, and give it to the sea snake. And we also fix the betel nut and put close to it. And we tell that sea snake, go ahead and eat and drink the dalaptep, chew your chew, then go back. Disrespect for the totem animal of the spirit could be costly. I was holding the piglet. Then all of a sudden, the piglet was going like this in my arm. When I look at him, the piglet is dying. So it's the stubborn spirit of the village. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't even say, can I take the piglet? So if you eat the devil one, and somebody of the clan becomes sick, In Yap, the main village spirits were descended from the goddess Margigi. The seven children of Margigi became the founders of Yap's political structure and imposed regular order in the life of Yapese. The coral atolls between Yap and Chu had their own patron spirits. On Kutu, this uh, red supposed to be a coast someone that look after the well-being of the people. Sarathim was the general that lead the, the people when they fought uh, among the islanders. And pull up. Warian. Yes, and he was supposed to have started the navigation. And Europe. There was um, a spirit they call uh, Ragunang, the firstborn of this couple, and now they worship that child. Each one had its own shrine or spirit house. Very small hut by itself at the very end of the island. Nice uh, coral around it. There's a platform that where it stays. In Yulavi, there are two to separate uh, altars, you do offerings to those uh, spirits, especially when you come in from uh, other islands. Yeah? My experience of a person being possessed was my adopted mother, who a time I went swimming, came back in the evening, and I just got shock of my life when I look. People were sitting around her, singing some kind of chant, and she was speaking, I could not understand what she was talking about. At that time, we were waiting for three canoes that uh, went to Faiz from Yuluthi, and they were already on their way back 
overdue. So people were wondering what happened. And when she was possessed, I just got scared because I was still young, small then. And he was, she was just saying things I could not understand. And people were so, sort of giving him support by doing this chanting. And that sort of infuriate her uh, to speak the more. And I could not understand what she was talking about. But after things were settled down, they start asking her what she was saying. And they said, the canoes are coming. The canoes are arriving. In some islands, such as Chuuk, people turn to the spirits of their own ancestors as their patrons. They believed that the souls of the dead could become ancestral spirits that helped their families. Everywhere, the funeral was an occasion for the expression of religious belief. The spirit of the dead person would hover around the body for three days before it went off to begin its ascent to the land of the spirits. During the third night, the spirit comes up. People would often burn the personal goods of a deceased to speed the spirit on its way. That individual who passed away, still looking at his belongings, mm -hmm. and he's having his mat and pillow, and still looking at his place. After we have to check his room, if there's still some belongings for him, then we'll bear burn them. The relatives bring the possessions of the deceased to the grave and burn them to get rid of them. They also bring manmars and food to the grave. And then there's a lightening of a little fire. Then we have done everything possible to make sure that the soul has gone to heaven. Some people believe that if we don't, that person will appear, you know, the spirit will come, always come and bother us. And then for lacing they have the red and white stone all around. They said that's to keep the evil spirit so they don't haunt people. After its departure, the spirit might undergo one or two tests before entering the abode of spirits. The details of a spirit's journey, though, could differ from one island group to another. Where this spirit goes is a specific one. It says it goes to the underworld. And then it goes to this area that um, is like a bridge and the spirit would go there and if they have a good voice and if they can go through all of this then they they will go to a, a better place in the underworld. So it's like the spirit would be moving around Palau and Anga would be the last place where they will go. Yeah. Yeah, the law is the Palawans who die they go there and there's like this pond. That's where they take a bath before they cross over to the spirit land. In Chuuk, these shrines usually took the form of model canoes suspended from the meeting house. In other places, they could be simple platform altars or sometimes small huts. And they build a small house on pillars and they have a platform inside. They put the coconut oil in the jar yeah. And they make these small uh, laces, they put on top of it, and they place it in the, uh, in the hut. Spirits could be called back to assist the living, but they had to be summoned by a special person who acted as a medium. There are some people that can bring the ghosts onto themselves and they can, they can talk to the ghost, or the ghost can talk through them. And that person like doing some chanting. And then that's when uh, the spirit of the third person comes. 
Possession usually starts with the person lying flat on her back, with eyes closed, and the old body would begin to tremble or shake. Then she would begin to speak in the voice of the deceased. Her voice already changed. Changed the voice. The face will change. Moving uh, her legs and then her hands flapping uh, all over, forms coming out from her mouth. The voice of the person talking is just the same as uh, the person that was already died. She was just saying things I could not understand. And people were so, sort of giving him support by doing this chanting. The purpose of spirit possession was to gain access to information from beyond. The spirits could provide helpful knowledge. They might have been the sources of medicines. Uh, they might have been the sources of identifying maladies. What to do to heal a sick person? Chants uh, given by the spirits. One of the famous men's dances is still performed today uh, was a spirit dance given by a spirit. Origins of the, the storytellers, the people who do the chants. So they tell us what it is to be done to improve things whether it's an illness or a situation. In Palau, these spirit mediums often serve the whole community, providing answers to questions like whether the village should go to war or not. The mediums operated in special spirit houses built to honor patron spirits. And there's a medium who is the only one allowed to the spirit house to talk to their god. He fixed his spirit a lot, go and chew and talk to the, the cat. They can only tell when the medium's voice uh, start to change very low and he starts chewing, spit on that uh, faster and spitting everywhere. Sometimes he turns red and, and that's when they know that uh, it's the cat's words that uh, he is relaying to us. Access to information was important for islanders. This could be obtained through the spirits of the dead, but there were other ways as well. Pue, or divination through counting the series of knots in coconut fronds, was one way. This could answer yes-no type questions. It was found nearly everywhere in Micronesia. People use coconut fronds to tie knots, and of course, they have a chant that is also going with Pue. And then, when it's done, you know, people will be able to tell whether it's a good day to sail or it's a good day to go fishing. Or... It's like tarot card. You ask a question and they're supposed to answer. During the war, in 1943 or 44, my grandfather used to sit outside and do this work while those people are down in the cave, uh, hiding away. He says, you may come out. No, no one will be harmed. And they did. Scattering pebbles on the ground and gauging the distribution of the rocks was another way of finding an answer to a question. Even the sound of thunder was sometimes used to predict the future. But they can always hear the thunder of their clan telling you somebody is very sick or somebody died at this place. Mm. Yeah, they speak through the thunder. There were three kinds of to-do. Who would they do there? One using stone, 
and one using uh, pantanus leaf, and the one using coconut leaves. Pompeians, at least at one time in their past, tended to think that um, there was no such thing as an accident, uh, and that illnesses had their causes in forces unseen. They called it nine so so. Somebody from who passed away was the one who was coming back and making people sick. The source of all diagnosis and healings was the spirits. Sometimes disease was a result of black magic or sorcery invoked by an enemy. Consequently, an effort had to be made to determine who invoked the malevolent spirits. The medicine had to be countered by other medicine. There is also a strong belief that people can make other people die. This is the ultimate black magic. If somebody wants to make other people sick or kill somebody, they can go to their cot and ask by offering them uh, in exchange a piece of uh, Palawan money or some food. Medicine was sometimes what we would call today a charm. They have magic words that uh, they have uh, some kind of a medicine. Today, a lot of people uh, looking for local medicines to cure the sick ones. Herbs and plants and magic. So one is like a ring that I have and it's made by an old man from Sarawal who passed away already. The second one is like a, a claw holding a ball. You wear it so that you're, you're protected from curse. Most religious rituals centered on local or even family spirits. It was conducted quietly at the small shrines where offerings were presented to the local deities, or sometimes, in the atolls of the Central Carolines, at the spirit houses built on the graves of the dead, or in Palau, in the miniature spirit houses often erected alongside the family home. But in a few places, there were larger monuments at which more formal ritual ceremonies were conducted. Ponape is perhaps the most striking example of these. Salapuk. Salapuk was a prominent center of ritual activities to Taukatau. And there was a stone in Salapuk where they indicated that Ponape originated. There is a large area where, where they apparently do all of the uh, rituals for the spirits so that the, the bread food will be plentiful. The priest would pray for the produce of the land in the east and in the west, and then he would pray for the fish to run. Wena. There is one uh, site there that is uh, dedicated to the ritual ceremonies of promoting the Sok San Lang. Sok San Lang was the highest uh, chief of the eastern half of Kichi. Sok San Lang apparently was uh, a secular as well as spiritual leader. Very, very developed uh, ritualistic stories that are affiliated with the Sok San Lang, with all of the priestly titles that they have even with the seven days of uh, ritual activities. Something to do with the, the produce of the land, the blessing of the, the produce of the land in certain areas. Emphasis here is more uh, offering to the spirits and the spirits so that the spirits will produce more.
Nanmadal was built as a ritual center on the border of the land and the sea. Two brothers, Olsipa and Olsopa, supposedly founded the shrine off Chemwen after trying to establish it in several other places. They combined the worship of the land and worship of the sea. There was a uh, deity that the Saudalors worshipped, and then there was a, a local mediary, uh, the sacred eel god, Nan Samo. What normally is done there is the traditional leader will be there, and after the intestines are fed to the Murey eel, that's the sacrificial part of the turtle, the turtle will be divided among the nobles of Medlanim. Kashrai had a cultic center at Lelu with rituals conducted by a priestly group. Lela was the seat of government on the island, but there were religious ceremonies related to the burial of chiefs. A lot of the rituals back, back during those days were based on, we call it Saka. You know, where that secret area is, is uh, are the royal tombs. They, they did uh, ceremonial things before they really, uh, you know, dispose of the, of the deads. Perhaps even more important than Leila was the temple to Sinlaka, the goddess of breadfruit. Her temple, I believe, is, is the center of the island. There was a massive amount of buildings, actually wooden thatch buildings on, on altars and walls and, and, and compounds. Uh, which was built there long ago. The place is a place for everyone to get together and do most of the religious ceremony up there by drinking kava, dancing. Sinlega's uh, power was actually attributed to uh, what she can do because whenever she would come around, the breadfruit will bloom, uh, the, the breadfruit will uh, bear fruit. After Christianity came to the islands, all the magic power went left. Sinlakas already knows that there is something will happen into this island. He told the, uh, the islander that uh, he saw a great light is coming. She feels scared and she warned those people that British Union will leave the island. When the missionaries game, she fled the island to Yap. But the spirits have not fled the islands. There are remnants of traditional religious beliefs and practices even today. Early Christians, we should not believe in those things. But I'm going to, this, just a regular lotion, body lotion. This, um, this is for you, just for your protection. 
people are always out to, to destroy you. So just go like this. Yeah, my father uh, have seen that thing. And he actually, I don't know if what, what you call possessed, uh, possessed him or uh, that's what they say. He got into him and crawling on all fours and barking. And uh, my mother went to hold his shoulder and then when he turned around, his eyes were blood red. And she said, I don't know if the spirit made me look at him like a dog or I did he actually, like his mouth was elongated and salivating and barking around the floor. Don't forget me, I'm still with you. You only need to look around you to find marks of the belief in the old spirits. And in case, in case you get lost in the forest, people believe that it's, it is not good to call a person by the name. People always calling names in the jungle and another spirit will answer them back, end up guiding them to another places. People put black magic on other people if they're more than them. It's a jealousy. And... There are people who can counteract curses. So when, he, let's say, if I have a big store and I, I think that some, some, something is wrong to slow down the activity of the, of the store, then I may think, ah, maybe somebody's cursing. So he, that guy would find another person who can reverse the cursing. People from uh, Prilu boys who joined the army and go to war always have that red cloth in, in their pocket and in their belongings or next to their body for their protection. Love potion, it's uh, being used in Guam by Yapis. A place um, that is tabooed from anybody stepping into it because it's believed that's where the spirits come around to huddle or to stay. And people are just afraid to go in there because the belief is if you go, step in it, something terrible would happen to you. You know, on, on the island of Yurpik, you still see horse there. And horse is still sitting there. there. That's their spirit. And it's in the form of a, a rock. Uh, you know, the belief is that people have to uh, respect and pay their tribute to horse. Christianity might have replaced the old religions in the islands, but the old spirits roam even today. Yeah. 